Okay, so today we are going to go through the pseudocode statements that you need to know for the IGCSE computer science exam. This video is actually the first in a two-part revision series since this topic is kind of big. So in today's video, we will go through these topics and in the next video, we'll go through these ones. So let's get into it. Okay, first let's look at how to declare constants and variables, which are like little containers that store values. A constant is a value that never changes while your program is running. To declare one, you use the word constant in all caps, then the name you want to give it, an equal sign, and the value. So for example, let's say that your company has 5 working days in a week, and that's never going to change. So you would make that a constant if you were to include this in your program. On the other hand, variables store values that have been calculated within the program and that can change during execution. You declare a variable like this, with the name of the variable and the data type that it stores. So here are some examples. Okay, to assign a value to a variable, you need to use a left arrow to show that a value belongs to an identifier. For example, if you have a variable called songs released and you want to store the integer 33, you will have to write it like this with this left arrow. You can update the value of this variable later on in the program like this. So here the value inside of songs released is incremented by 1 and then stored inside of songs released again. You can also store and update variables using values from other variables as long as the data types align. To get a user to input a value into a variable, you need to use the input keyword followed by the name of the variable that you want to store their input in. As for outputting the contents of a variable, the output keyword is used along with the name of the variable, but you can also output other things like other than variables such as like strings and numbers. If you want to output more than one value on the same line, you can use a comma to show that you know these are all part of the same output statement. Okay, on to arithmetic operations. So these symbols here are used to represent these math operations, which I'm sure that you're already familiar with. So following mathematical conventions, multiplication and division have higher precedence over addition and subtraction, meaning to say that you should do multiplication and division before you do these two. So for example, if you have this, you should do 5 times 2 before you add 7. However, it is good practice to make the order of operations in complex expressions clearer by using brackets like this. Another operation that you have to know is the diff operation or integer division, which finds the integer result after division and discards any decimal numbers. For example, 5 divided by 2 is 2.5, right? However, in integer division, the 0.5 is dropped leaving us with just the value 2. There's also the modulus or mod operation, which returns the remainder after the division of two numbers. For example, mod 5 2 gives us 1, since that's the remainder after 5 is divided by 2. Next, we have relational operations, which are shown through these inequality symbols and are used to compare two values. We also have the logical operations of AND, OR, and NOT, so these three allow us to perform Boolean operations and also allow us to form more complex statements. For example, we can use the AND operator to expand an IF statement to include two conditions. For example, this is if age is greater than or equal to 18 and height is greater than or equal to 160, then output entry granted. Alright, speaking of IF statements, if statements are used when a program needs to make decisions and perform different actions depending on whether a condition is true or false. So here's the structure of an if statement. You begin with the keyword if and state the required condition and you close with the end if keyword. For example, let's take a look at this bit of pseudocode. If a student scores um, above 60 in an exam, the program will output the word pass it wouldn't need to go to the else clause because this condition has already been fulfilled. It will just jump directly to the end if statement. However, if the student did not meet this condition, so they got below 60, we would have to move to the else clause and the program will output the word fail. An if statement does not always have an else clause by the way. If there's no need for an else clause, you can just omit the else keyword altogether and just close with an end if. So it will depend on the type of question that you get in the exam. Another thing to note is that you are allowed to put if statements inside of other if statements. So for example here, we have two ifs inside of this bigger if. So these are called nested if statements. For example, maybe the program from earlier has to be amended so that scoring 80 and above outputs an A, 
and then scoring 70 and above outputs a B, and so on. So all these are like nested ifs. The other type of selection statements is case statements, which are used when the program needs to perform different actions depending on the value of a variable. Here's the structure of a case statement and an example. Basically, the program will look at the value of a variable and check it against these possible cases. It goes through the cases one at a time until it finds the matching case. So if there's a match, the program will execute the statement corresponding to that case. But if there were no matches, then it moves to the otherwise clause. And again, um, an otherwise clause is not necessary to include if there's no need for it. So if there's no otherwise clause, it will just jump to the end case. Here's another example of a case statement. So as you can see, case statements may use less code than if statements and are useful when comparing multiple values of the same variable. However, if statements are more flexible for complex decisions. Now onto iteration. There are three types of iteration statements or loops. So there's the count control loop, post condition loop, and precondition loop. A count control loop is used if the number of iterations is already known in advance. So an example in real life is if you go to the store for three days consecutively to get three random presents for three friends. For the post condition loop, the loop has to be executed at least once before the loop's condition is checked. For example, keep going to the store every day until you find a suitable present for your friend. And for the precondition loop, the loop may not be executed at all depending on the condition which is checked beforehand. For example, before you leave the house, check if you have a suitable present for your friend. If not, go to the store. Keep going every day while you still don't have one. In pseudocode, we use a for loop for a count control loop. Here's the structure for the for loop and an example of how it works. In this example, we are outputting this statement three times. So what's happening is that the identifier variable is assigned each of these integer values from value one to value two, one at a time. So in this case, we set our for loop to have a lower bound of one and an upper bound of three. Then the statements inside the for loop are executed after each assignment, meaning that um, I is assigned the number one, then the statement is executed, and then we go on to the next I, which is two. So I is assigned a number two, the statement is executed, we go on to the next I, which is three. So I is assigned three, the statement is executed, and that's it because this is the upper bound three. So we already hit the upper bound, so we can just move on. So here's another example. In this scenario, the program has an array called student scores containing the scores of 30 students. So the program accesses each of the indexes one at a time and the scores are totaled up in the loop. So after the loop ends, the average score is found by dividing the total score by 30 and then the average score is outputted. For post condition loops, the repeat until loop is used. Here's the structure of the loop and an example of it. The statements in the loop must be executed at least once. After that, the condition is tested. If the condition is true, the loop terminates. Otherwise, the statements are executed again. In the example here, the program is requesting for a user to enter their password in order to log in. So if they input it but they don't get it right, the statements will be repeated until they do get it right. So that's why it's called the repeat until loop. For the precondition loop, while loops are used. It is quite similar to the repeat until loop, except that the condition is tested at the beginning of the loop. So here's an example. What's happening is that the statements in the loop will only be executed if the condition is true. After the statements are executed, the condition is tested again, and the loop terminates when the condition evaluates the false. Here in this loop, the variable number is tested to see if it is greater than 9. So it, if it is greater than 9, then we have to do the statements inside the loop. And then at the end, we have to check again to see if the condition is still true. So if it is, the loop will just continue. So this will keep going until the condition becomes false, at which we can you know, end the while loop. Okay, so that's it for part one of this pseudocode guide. Please leave any questions that you have in the comments, and thank you so much for watching.